This is CBC Here and Now. Collision deaths, four people die as a result of vehicle accidents. Thousands are at risk of dropping out of school. Is there a solution? We still have to get creative now. International affairs expert Gwyn Dyer is home. He weighs in on North Korea. I may not be able to win this war, but I can hurt you a lot. Well, after a very, very wet weekend across St. John's and the Avalon, Mother Nature spreads the wealth up across the island tonight with periods of rain and drizzle lingering into Wednesday. The details are coming up. Well, it was a deadly day on the province's roads. Four people were killed in a two separate accidents. On the west coast in Cowhead at around 8.30 this morning, a high school student was walking to school on Main Street when he was struck and killed by a vehicle. Yes, a 17-year-old young man was a student at Long Range Academy. A crisis response team is now on site at the school. It's open to students and members of the community. On the East Coast, a head-on collision just before noon on Veterans Memorial Highway has left three people dead. One survivor was taken to hospital. The accident happened on the Conception Bay North Highway between Roach's Line and Mackinson's. Traffic was being diverted for most of the day, but the RCMP just reopened that section of the road about 20 minutes ago. Their investigation continues. Well, the Prime Minister is touching down in this province and he isn't coming alone. He's bringing his cabinet colleagues for two days of meetings in St. John's. Yes, some uh, local issues will be on the agenda. Here and now is Peter Cowan is live from the Arts and Culture Centre where Justin Trudeau is attending an event tonight. So, Peter, what's happening there? Well, Carolyn, it seems fitting on the anniversary of 9-11 that there's going to be a performance of Come From Away on stage here at the Arts and Culture Centre today. And this is going to be the first chance we've had in order to see the Canadian cast perform before they end up on stage in Winnipeg and Toronto next year. But it's not just going to be entertainment. The caucus, or the, rather the cabinet and the prime minister are here for some business and the newly minted regional minister has a few local issues that he's putting on the agenda. I also want to reposition cabinet ministers because so many of them, as we well know, you know, think of St. John's as some sort of uh, just outside of Halifax place. Uh, they're going to end up flying, uh, some of them, you know, an hour and a half from Ottawa to Halifax and then an hour and a half from Halifax to St. John's. You know, we are our own distinct entity requiring our own distinct services um, and that's why I need them to pay a particular attention to oil and gas here and I need them to pay particular attention to the fishery. Now, now the Premier is going to have a chance to address the Federal Cabinet tomorrow morning as well, and he's got some of his own issues that he's going to talk about. I'm told that one of the biggest issues is going to be the environmental assessment for oil and gas industries. The Federal Government has put an additional layer on there. The local industry wants the CNL-OPB to take back responsibility for fears that the extra layer could increase the time it takes to get approvals and drive big oil companies and their investment dollars to other jurisdictions. The next big issue is around the small business tax changes that the finance minister unveiled this summer. It's an issue that's national in scope, but the premier's been hearing it from business leaders in this province. Concerns that while the finance minister says they're closing loopholes, business people feel that it's going to unnecessarily increase the amount of tax that they're paying. The third issue that's going to be raised is around indigenous issues. The Innu, for example, have an inquiry that's coming up looking at children in care. Right now, the Innu and the province are on board, but there's still no commitment yet from the federal government to join that inquiry. So the premier is going to be pressing that issue when he addresses cabinet tomorrow. It's going to be two days of meetings, and we're expecting that the prime minister will answer a few questions before it all wraps up on Wednesday. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. We're not done with the story yet. In about 20 minutes, the CBC's David Cochran will join us to talk about what else is on the table at this cabinet retreat. Four people have been forced from their homes following a duplex fire in the Shea Heights area of St. John's yesterday evening. The fire broke out in a Newfoundland and Labrador housing unit on Chafe Avenue. One woman lived in the attached home that sustained the most damage, while a family of three lived on the other side. All escaped safely, and today police are investigating the cause of that fire. 
Well-known humor columnist Ed Smith died on Friday. Smith was a longtime teacher who lived in Springdale. He was best known in this province for his writing. He authored several books and wrote a humorous newspaper column called The View From Here. Smith was seriously injured in a car accident two decades ago that left him paralyzed from the shoulders down. Thousands of children headed back to school last week, and for an alarming number of them, this year will be their last. And it's not because of graduation, but because of the province's high dropout rate. Here now is Ryan Cook has more. Some of all those Tanika Hader reached a breaking point in grade 10. Two years ago, she was wrought with anxiety and had to work alone in a separate classroom. She dropped out. I didn't want to let anybody else down, you know, with what I did and the choices but I knew that as soon as I dropped out that you know I, I knew I couldn't go back. An average of 1,200 students drop out each year in the province. According to the Premier's Task Force on Education, 4,491 students are potential dropouts. Now it's estimated these students cost the provincial government 20 million dollars annually in government support. At O'Donnell High School in Mount Pearl, Principal Michelle Clemens knows just how hard it is to reach those at-risk kids. And these last group of students need very individualized responses and we really got to start thinking outside of, of the box as to, because we have done innumerable things to prevent them from dropping out of school. So everything we've done and everything we've tried, we still have to get creative now. We have to really think outside the box. So what can be done? Clemens says they can partner with groups like Thrive and Choices for Youth who can help children work at their own pace outside the stress of a classroom. Tanika Hader found her saving grace at Thrive last year. It's great. It's been fantastic. The program is amazing for me. It fits me academically. They take it at my pace. And, you know, if I have to spend the next three years here getting my GED, that's fine with them. Hater has one day of classes each week. She chooses the subject and works at her own pace. She entered the program with a sixth grade understanding of math, but by the end of last year, she was at an eighth grade level. In seven months, I went up two grade levels in math mentally. And that was just, I was ecstatic to hear those results because I didn't think that a program like this could, you know, teach me so much. The task force report found the regular pace of a classroom is not working for thousands of students. And Clemens believes it is here in a place like Thrive where a solution lies. For Tanika Hader, it saved her future. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Last week's population report predicts Corner Brook will shrink over the next 20 years. As people grow older, there are fewer young people coming in to replenish the population and fewer young families. Here and now's Colleen Connors looks into how city leaders are trying to find ways to adjust to an aging population. Corner Brook is an aging city with many people who are retired living here in Corner Brook. And the newest Harris Centre study shows that the population is getting older and smaller, 20% smaller. Well, it's really no big surprise. We've been experiencing this decline in all of rural Newfoundland for the last you know, 30 years plus. There aren't enough young people staying here, nor are there enough young people moving in. One of the big issues, of course, is lack of jobs. I mean, you have to have not only jobs, but good jobs, meaningful jobs, where people today uh, are very mobile, and if they can't find a good job here, they're going to go somewhere else. And they have. A clear example, Cornerbrook now has one high school and one junior high. There were less than 200 graduates last year. Fewer students leads to fewer teaching jobs, which leads to fewer people studying education. A maximum of 50 students can take this program in Cornerbrook now. That's down from a few years ago. So we actually reduced our seats by about 200 students a year in, in about five years ago. So for those that are wondering about that, there's actually a thousand less people on the streets looking for work. No young kids equals no work and adjustments need to be made. But the mayor wants more than adjustments. He wants to increase numbers and suggests many ways that that could be done. Better infrastructure, promotion of the outdoor adventure lifestyle on the West Coast, support of small business owners, and working with immigration to bring families in to stay. So there's a whole 
list of things that you can do and no one thing will make it better. It's all of these little steps at the same time, everybody pulling on the oars in the same direction, one step at a time and moving forward and that's, that's the best we can do. Pender's list to make Cornerbrook young and vibrant again is only possible with help of resources from the provincial and the federal government. And he insists that young people in their 30s are moving home and finding work here. But only statistics and time will tell us if that's true. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, still in Corner Brook, Mayor Charles Pender, who we just heard from, says something bizarre is going on in his campaign to be reelected. Pender says someone is plastering wieners on his property. In this case, his vehicle and his campaign signs are also being broken and wieners pushed into them. Four signs have been damaged so far. Pender says what's most worrisome to him is that the incident involving his car windshield was done in his driveway at night. He's now filed an official complaint with the police. Premier Dwight Ball says now core secrecy surrounding Muskrat Falls contractors doesn't pass his smell test. A report in the Weekend Telegram revealed about 90% of Muskrat's management team is made up of embedded contractors who've billed nearly 4.6 million hours to the Provincial Energy Corporation. But now Corps refuses to disclose the hourly billing rates of those contractors, declaring it commercially sensitive information. When asked by reporters today, Ball said he doesn't buy it and said work is underway for an inquiry. I've already asked the various departments to you know, come up with uh, terms of reference that an inquiry would look like. Our objective here was to get this project finished strong. We did not want to cause any disruption, but that inquiry, we are not waiting for people to be packing their lunch boxes and getting off that site before the inquiry will be done. We'll be getting that, you know, start as quickly as possible. People in this province, they have a right to know what's going on at Muskrat Falls. It's their money that is being spent. A big shakeup today for the Progressive Conservative Party in this province. Steve Kent is leaving office. After two decades in elected politics, the Mount Pearl North MHA is making a career change. He's the new city manager for Mount Pearl. Now, dozens gathered at a coffee shop in Mount Pearl this afternoon for the announcement. With his wife and three children looking on, Kent confirmed he will leave politics October 10th and take over as the chief administrative officer in the city. Kent will earn just under $200,000 annually as the CAO, doubling his current salary as opposition MHA. He said the move was the right one at the right time. For the better part of the last decade, I've been completely unwilling to even entertain other possibilities. Well, recently, in light of our family situation, in, in light of where we are politically, in light of where I am personally in my career and in my life, I felt it was time to at least be open to some of those possibilities. Kent said today was his last political speech, but wouldn't rule out a possible return to politics in the future. A mixed martial arts fighter from Ship Cove on the province's northern peninsula lost his second UFC fight this weekend. And while fans of Gavin Tucker are disappointed, some are questioning why a referee didn't stop the fight sooner. Tucker fought featherweight Rick Glenn Saturday night in Edmonton. He suffered four broken bones in his face as well as his orbital and jaw fractures. During and after the fight, many on social media demanded why the official didn't end the match earlier when it was clear Tucker was having trouble recovering. Even UFC President Dana White chimed in with criticism and so did MMA writer E. Spencer Kite got to the point where it was tough to watch. Gavin's absolutely a tough kid. People do get hurt. That is understood. But there's also a line to it. And Rick Glenn even spoke about it after the fight. You know, he said in his post-fight interview that he thought it should have been stopped. He actually looked up at the, the referee during the third round and kind of gave him the look of like, hey, man, are you going to stop this? Because I don't want to be punching this guy anymore. I don't want to be beating him up anymore. But if the referee doesn't stop it, the other guy has to keep fighting. 
Well, from one sport to another, the Brad Guju team grabbed a big win on the weekend at the Grand Slam of Curling's Tour Challenge. The Briar champion from this province down Stefan Wallstedt of Norway 9-1 on Sunday in Regina. Guju started hot with a deuce in the first end and three points in the second en route to a 5-0 lead. Then Guju added back-to-back uh, -back deuces in the fifth and sixth, prompting handshakes from both sides to end the match. The victory marked a big week for Guzhu, whose team went undefeated at the first Grand Slam tournament of the season. Well, the Prime Minister and his federal cabinet are in St. John's for meetings, and so is political reporter David Cocker, and he's joining us just ahead to tell us what's on the agenda. Welcome back, everyone. And before we get to the weather, we have the latest on Hurricane Irma. That's right. The system has been downgraded to a tropical storm. Uh, now moving inland over uh, southern Georgia, but the Florida damage uh, has been done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, millions of people are still without electricity. And this afternoon, I spoke with Charles and Deborah Randall of Logie Bay. They're in western Florida right now, and they talked about their experience last night riding out the storm. First, there was, a, there was an eerie calm, and, and there was nobody on the street. There was no cars. You look out the window, you felt like you were probably alone in the world, except for you know, the media uh, that were uh, giving just continuous coverage. And 
knew was really a, not a bad day, but then towards after the afternoon, the wind started to pick up, and then like it, it just continued to grow and continued to grow and continued to grow uh, up to where we got tropical storm force, and then a band would, you know, that band would pass, and it would be a lull, um, and, and then when it would come back again, it would get even it would get even louder. So we we had a bed set up not that we were going to sleep that you was know, surrounded by couches and things away from the windows and and by 10 o'clock last night it was just roaring we we could we we had to shout practically to to hear each other you could hear Um, the windows rattling the the rain beating up against the um the windows and you were just thinking okay is that window gonna blow in because that's what they were constantly talking about is you know making sure that you stay away from windows you have your doors within your house closed uh, so that it doesn't build up any pressure and so on. So we were just trying to be... Um, we, we had a fallback area set up, an interior room that we were ready to go into. And there were times when we were thinking, yeah, maybe we should go in there. And you looked out into the street in front and for a while it was, it was uh, just torrents of water running down the street. And uh, then by probably by about 11 o'clock last night, the water just wasn't running anywhere it was just you could see it just rising even in the street in front of us and it was just kind of ripples and waves as the wind would go up up the street were we afraid i would have to admit yeah we, we were, we were but, scared. but yeah but i don't think we I, I, I know personally i don't think there's a point like you know gee, we're gonna die it was more this this could get really bad and really uncomfortable and uh, i i, and I guess... did get pretty uncomfortable it just fortunately you know the damage well, there's damage done out around but uh, this place is safe and it, everyone here now is just kind of through through a new lens new perspective just saying you know what it could have been so much worse because Definitely could have been worse, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I, again, up to uh, 9,000 Canadians in Florida at the time of the storm. How many Newfoundlanders? I'd say a good chunk of them were Newfoundlanders as well. So uh, glad to hear they made it out okay. Uh, here's the latest on Tropical Storm Irma right now. And it again, rolling into southern Georgia, as we mentioned, still some gusts up to 100 kilometers per hour. The biggest threat now is indeed going to be the rainfall. Uh, will spread widespread 50 to 100 millimeter amounts across Georgia over the next day or so as it peters out into just a big old low. How about... 100 plus millimeters here at home. These are totals since Friday, anywhere from Mount Pearl up through the metro region, uh, looking at 100 to 140 millimeters of rain since Friday. It has been a wet one, no question. And the rain continues. Uh, Again, contrary to reports, that rain over the weekend not connected to Irma. Irma continued to, again, rolling up into the southeast U.S. Uh, and this new uh, low that's been developing off to our south is spinning into the region with, yes, more rain. And that rain ramping up right now across southern parts of the Avalon once again. Pretty solid band right now rolling over the southeast Avalon, just pushing in to the metro region. Very heavy rain right now in Fairland. And again, that is on the way for St. John's over the next 20 minutes or so. Rainfall warnings are in effect uh, for St. John's and the Avalon. Wind warnings are in effect for the south coast with those winds coming from the northeast gust up to 100 kilometers per hour through this evening and a special weather statement in effect for the Port of Basque region for some heavier rain uh, there as well. Latest projections from the forecast models, another 22 upwards of 40 millimeters of rain up that northeast coast uh, from Metro right up into the uh, uh, northern peninsula region. Even Cornerbrook could pick up in that 10, 20 millimeter range by the time we get through the day on Tuesday. There's the forecast model projection showing that rain spreading up into central western Newfoundland tonight by Tuesday morning. I think the heaviest rain is from Bonavista Bay back across to Cornerbrook. Some steadier rains not out of the question for Port of Basque, but I think the southeast part of the island, St. John's, the Avalon, the Buren Peninsula, mainly just drizzle with uh, fog patches on the go as winds are going to be in from the northeast. It's a quiet start for the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador. Even the risk of some frost over the southeast parts of Labrador. But as we work throughout the day, that cloud will build in. I think the best chance of rain pretty much uh, through the day tomorrow will be along the northern peninsula and again along that north coast as uh, central Newfoundland, the west, tapers off to more shower and drizzle activity. St. John's Metro, again, 16 degrees into the afternoon. Some cloudy period, uh, certainly clouds dominating with some periods of drizzle and fog continuing. And that's the name of the game into tomorrow evening as well as winds generally stay in from the east. 
Wouldn't rule out a sunny break or two, Placentia Bay down to the Buren Peninsula. That's about it. Again, early bit of sun possible for the Northern Peninsula. Uh, everybody else, it's dominant clouds tomorrow, periods of rain and drizzle again, most persistent through central and west. And into Labrador, we're talking about some sunshine, Happy Valley Goose Bay, but building clouds through the day up towards the north coast as well, building clouds and showers in the straits and building clouds and showers in the west as well. We'll talk about your long range forecast in detail coming up, Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, it seems the Liberal cabinet won't be enjoying any good weather while they're in St. John's. Let's go back and check in now with a familiar face to hear now, viewers. It's David Cochran. And these days, he's a senior reporter with CBC's Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. Nice to see you, David. Hi, Debbie. Good to be home. <laughs> so why is the cabinet holding this retreat here? Well, Debbie, I tell you, it's definitely not for the weather, right? I, I mean, I haven't been home in a year. I haven't been this wet and cold and mm. soaked in, in about 15 months. I mean, they're here to get ready in, in no small part for the reopening of the House of Commons in about a week or so and plan out the fall legislative agenda. But politically, they want to do a couple of things. This is a seat where the uh, province really won all seven seats, a region where they won all the seats in Atlantic Canada. And coming here sends a message that this place is important to them politically. And while they're here, one of the things we're told that the Liberals really want to do is to sharpen their message on the economy. One of the things they want to sell to Canadian voters is that they have been excellent stewards of the national economy. You have blistering growth rates across the country, 4.5% in some quarters, so high that the Bank of Canada has felt the need to bump interest rates up to try to slow things down and manage them a little bit. And they've had eight really good months of job growth, uh, getting to basically full employment in some provinces. The problem they're going to have with that economic message is the contrast with the reality on the ground here. You know, the Newfoundland and Labrador economy is in recession, unemployment is growing. You saw the report from the Harris Centre last week. There's a demographic population challenge coming to this province. So the celebratory message coming from Justin Trudeau will be in stark contrast to the reality that Dwight Ball has to deal with as the premier and leader of this provincial government. So one of the things I'm told is that the Liberals will not shy away from highlighting the success they're having nationally, nationally but also offer reassurances to Dwight Ball and offer reassurances to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador that they are not going to forget one particular region of the province and that even though things are tough here that this government is here to help them but you know Debbie as Peter was talking about earlier there's challenges here with environmental concerns and with tax concerns that has the business community and the oil industry and the premier himself pretty nervous about things. Yeah as you say the landscape in this province is so different from the rest of the country and on those points that uh, the premier wants to talk about tax reform and environmental oversight of our offshore how receptive is the premier or the prime minister and the cabinet going to be about uh, to those concerns yeah, these, they mean, these tax changes have been extremely unpopular with dockers and small businesses right across the country. The Liberals can see that they kind of blew the public relations battle right out of the gate and get, got outflanked by a, a more organized uh, opposition and lobby on this. What I'm told that Premier Dwight Ball, the, the case he's going to make to the federal cabinet tomorrow when he goes in there is that, look, this is not just bumping up tax rates by a couple of points here or there and, and taking some money away. This is a wholesale structural change to the economy that really affects small businesses and doctors. And it's going to have an acute impact in rural Newfoundland and Labrador and right across rural Areas in Atlantic Canada where the Liberals do hold every single seat. All the governments struggle to get medical professionals to go to small towns. Small towns also have the challenge of higher costs and lower margins for a lot of private companies which also happen to be family owned in many cases and these proposed tax changes are, are going to be a real problem for them. So there has been messaging from the Liberals, from Finance Minister Bill Morneau and from the Prime Minister that they are maybe willing to be flexible on how they implement these things but they're going to go ahead with them. You know they feel that they lost the initial push on the tax stuff, but they think that their message of fairness is starting to break through and they, they, they insist that they have internal polling that show that you know things are, are the public opinion isn't necessarily as against these tax proposals as doctors and small business lobbyists would have you believe. The challenge for them of course is that the conservatives have been jumping on this and, and you know no conservative party ever, ever struggled by fighting against a tax increase. They've been trying to really paint the, the liberals as the party that takes money from doctors, takes money from small businesses and gives it to a guy like Omar Cotter. And so this is the PR challenge that the government is going to spend some time here dealing with in addition to getting briefed on the Canada-US relations where NAFTA negotiations are and, and, and a deep dive in the latest census and demographic data uh, from the chief statistician as, as they get ready to enter the second half of their mandate and look at the economic challenges that they're going to face as they head into the re-election run. Well, David, thank you very much. We're going to leave it there. An interesting couple of days ahead. Thanks for your perspective. Thanks, Debbie. Great to see you.
But a thousand people are coming to hear Gwyn Dyer speak tonight. He's going to talk about Donald Trump. On Here and Now, we're going to talk about another contentious issue, North Korea. Foreign Affairs Analyst Gwyn Dyer is in town. He kicks off Memorial University's 2017 Galbraith Lecture Series. I'll have the honor of introducing him later tonight. And he's been good enough to pop by here now to have a discussion about international events. Good to see you again. Welcome home. Nice to see you. Uh, I know you're talking about Trump tonight, but I'd like to focus your attention in Asia. Uh, when you think of the world's powder kegs and everything that's happened in North Korea of late, the nuclear test last week, what's your assessment of the region? And missiles and so on. I think the Americans are more spooked by the missiles than the nukes, actually, because otherwise the nukes couldn't come anywhere near them. Um, yeah, powder cake, okay. Um, well, it's a powder cake if you attack North Korea. And if you don't, it's probably not that big a deal. Um, I mean, you have to start, with, you know, why is North Korea doing this, okay? Are they planning to have a war with the United States? I don't think so. You know, they'd all be dead. Yeah, well, you know, North Korea would blow. They threaten to rain death in this rhetoric. It's such I, a strange I, I state. I know. That's, you know, this is like Trump, you know. I mean, it's you know, fire and brimstone. Um, but, you know, what would be the motive for a country which is not very rich, in fact, it's dirt poor, 
to spend 20 years and untold amounts of money and human effort to get nuclear weapons mm -hmm. when it is absolutely obvious that they will maybe one day end up with 50 or 100 nuclear weapons and the Americans will still have several thousand. But what sort of leverage does it give a, a, a strange hermit state where, it, I mean, it, I visited the border, the place it's is survival. Poor. It's survival there. This is deterrence. Remember deterrence? Mm -hmm. You know, I may not be able to win this war, but I can hurt you a lot, and so don't attack me. And if you hadn't got it already, and you happen to be a North Korean dictator, to pick an example at random, uh, all you had to do was watch what happened to Saddam Hussein, who didn't have nuclear weapons, and um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who didn't have nuclear weapons, and you think, hmm, nuclear weapons good for me. For a dictator who wants to stay, stay in power. Who wants to stay alive, even. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and you don't want to start a war with a superpower. That would be foolish. But the superpower might, because it's never said it wouldn't, start a war with you. Right. Uh, certainly, I mean, you know, you can't, if you're North Korean, you don't take the Americans on trust. And they've never said they wouldn't. Right. And uh, one can imagine various scenarios in which nobody actually plans a war, but there is a war and the Americans decide we're going to shut this one down quick. Few nuclear weapons and you're gone. Well, you know, the insurance for that is nukes of your own. Right. And particularly nukes, at least on missiles that can reach the west coast of the United States, if not all the way to Washington doesn't indicate malevolent intent necessarily. But you look at it from Japan's point of view or South Korea, the, the decision to actually fire a missile, you, you don't see that as a provocation that could lead to unintended consequences? Well, I suppose it could, but I mean, uh, from a North Korean point of view, I'd rather take that risk than not have nukes. To send a message. You know, I mean, this is my insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And um, frankly, um, I, you know, there's a great deal, particularly the Japanese, who actually have a prime minister who wants to rearm Japan and make it a normal nation with military alliances and troops abroad and fighting wars and good stuff, stuff right. like that. Um, uh, he is um, prone to exaggerate the threat, shall we say. I mean, and there's you know, not a lot of enthusiasm in Asia to see J uh, Japan uh, militarize again. Uh, they're not waiting for Japan to come back. Actually, they're praying it doesn't, not in the old way at least. Um, and I don't think Abe intends it to come back in the old way, Banzai. But, but nevertheless, um, you know, here we have a country which is having occasionally a ballistic missile fired overhead, just like every day gaz gazillions of satellites go overhead every 90 minutes. And, you know, it's going overhead at, you know, it's out of the atmosphere at this point. It's not violating airspace or anything. The likelihood that it is actually going to drop a nuclear weapon on Japan is minuscule and will be evident within minutes of launch because it will be a very different trajectory if it's intended to drop on Japan. Mm -hmm. So it's just another rocket going overhead. Um, the Japanese actually pulled all the stops out and warned the population to go into the shelters. I mean, excuse me, this is publicity, right? That's mm -hmm. all it is. It's furthering obvious domestic objectives. But I, you know, and, and the Americans, you know, they're, in the end, I don't think they're stupid enough to attack North Korea. The Americans are trying once again, as they've done before, to try to get some more economic sanctions. I think it's before the UN Security Council. Uh, just to end this interview, where, where do the Russians and the Chinese fit in this? Because it seems China's trying to cooperate more than it usually does, whereas the Russians want no part of it. The Russians don't want a war there, and the Russians are trying to talk common sense, frankly. And this one, they're good guys. Uh, the Chinese really don't want to see North Korea go down but they really are cross with the way North Korea is behaving. On the other hand, they too are going to have to accept the nuclear, that North Korea is a nuclear weapons power. We got used to uh, India, we got used to uh, uh, Pakistan, the Arabs all got used to Israel having nuclear weapons, and here comes another one. Right. And deterrence works just as well in that case. Gwen Dyer, thank you very much. Always like your insight, and I look forward to introducing you later tonight. Thanks. Thank you, see you again. Right. Still with international affairs, we all know Gander's role in the events following September 11, 2001. But flights also landed at Goose Bay, Stephenville, Deer Lake and St. John's. Tonight, a look back at some of those who stayed just around the corner from CBC here. Reporter Jane Aidy spoke with people at St. David's Presbyterian Church on Elizabeth Avenue. Uh, this is wonderful. I've been in Quebec and other parts of Canada, but this, this place just absolutely takes the cake. This church here, St. David's, is the nicest people. 
They brought us all over here last night about uh, 1 o'clock. Had beds all set up, all kinds of food, drinks, and everything. And they're the loving, friendliest, sweetest people I've ever seen. They've just been catering to us in every way they can. And then this gym down the street. I, the YMCA? Name? No, the YM, YWCA took the women, but this gym down the street here, next block here, I forget the name, uh, took them in. And uh, that was real good. That's why my hair is kind of messed up. But the, uh, we sat in the plane. We came from Brussels and we're on the way to Dallas. And so we sat in the plane probably about uh, 18 hours. And so we slept in our clothes. You know, of course, they wouldn't let us take anything off except our wallet and passport, the men. And the women, they could take their purse and their medicines. But people downtown at the uh, hockey uh, uh, center, whatever that is, the convention center, great. Everything was free. They had water. We were thirsty because we hadn't had much to drink. They had water, everything free, all, everything. Bus drivers, police officers, everywhere. I've never seen such friendly, and I'm an ex-cop from Los Angeles. And uh, the police officers were all friendly and smiling, which, you know, really impressed me right off the bat at the airport. I guess Beautiful after people. what's happened in, in your country, this is pretty heartwarming. Yes, it is, because, see, I uh, live 100 miles from Oklahoma City, where we had the, the bombing in 95. Uh, and that was terrible, but that was nothing in comparison with this catastrophe. This is really ridiculous where uh, terrorists can come into our country and get by with that. We need to strengthen our uh, uh, security on terrorists and we need to get, them, get rid of them. Get rid of them completely. Get them out of our, all the countries. Hard to believe that there's people out there with so much hate in them that they're willing to sacrifice all these innocent lives to make some point on democracy. It's ridiculous. They showed clips of the people in Iraq partying in the streets, burning American flags, and thanking Allah for killing all these people. What sort of faith is that if you're thanking your God for all the harm and all these people that are suffering in the world that don't understand that? It's a very depressed, hard time. And right now, though, I'm more amazed by how it seems the world is really coming together to uh, combat this evil and help everyone that's stuck in the middle. Like all the people that are stranded here in St. John, everyone has been taken care of very well and uh, is in good spirits and it's just really trying to help one another and be a good Samaritan. I think that's really wonderful. Every new mayoral candidate in St. John's is taking a bite out of the competition. Check out this campaign video from Potholes will be a singer of the past Glenn Redmond with Finn's hands on leadership. Finn. Business owners see a bright future with Finn at the helm. Finn's tax reduction plan is a real eye opener that's got people talking. Well, you've got my vote. High five. That sounds great. He understands the challenges that young families face today. The city of legends is ready for a change. Vote Finn for mayor of St. John's. This message has been personally endorsed by Finn.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's an unusual story from the Canadian Armed Forces base in St. John's, where a court martial is underway for a member of the Royal Newfoundland Regiment. Master Corporal Greg Young is accused of mistreating recruits while he was an instructor during basic training. It's a case that illustrates how much things are changing with today's military. Here now, Zach Gowdy was at the court martial and he joins me now. So, Zach, uh, what is Master Corporal Young accused of? Well, the military term for it is ill treating a subordinate. Um, I think in a normal workplace you would call it bullying uh, or harassment or abuse of authority. Um, of course, the military is not a normal workplace, uh, but it is changing quite a lot. And one of those changes is a push to bring its workplace culture uh, more in line with modern standards of acceptable behavior and, and what is not acceptable behavior. So Corporal Greg Young is accused of two incidents, one in which he is alleged to have forced a recruit to eat vegetables until he threw up, and another in which he is alleged to have forced a recruit to drink water until she was ill. Uh, both incidents occurred in the summer of 2015, and Master Corporal Greg Young has pleaded not guilty. Okay, do you have any more details about those incidents? Yeah, so we have heard this story this morning from three different witnesses who each told the broad strokes in the same way, but the details varied wildly from one witness to the next, which of course is not unusual with witness testimony. Uh, but to me, two things really stood out. One is that these things happened two, more than two years ago in the summer of 2015, and many of the people involved were very young, teenagers at the time, 16 and 17 years old in some cases. Uh, so in the first incident, which the defense lawyer repeatedly called the sweet pea incident, um, a particular recruit was known not to like vegetables. It was something of a joke in the unit. So-and-so doesn't eat their veggies at mealtime. So during one meal, Master Corporal Greg Young is accused of having taken a plate of these veggies, given it to this recruit, and forced him to eat the whole plate or that the entire unit would be subject to a group punishment, a difficult physical task. Each of these witnesses says that this uh, recruit tried but was physically unable to eat the vegetables. So one witness described this as kind of a jocular scene, that they were all cheering him on, eat the veggies. Another said that it started that way, but they very quickly became uncomfortable with what was happening. And another witness said that what she observed was uh, wrong or misguided to begin with. And of course, uh, Master Corporal Young um, takes quite a lot of issue with just about all parts of that story. Okay, so that's one incident, but there's another as well with uh, water drinking. Yeah, so a similar scenario. One day uh, during a long run, a particular recruit uh, got a stitch in her side and their superiors uh, attributed that to not having hydrated enough before the run began. So then uh, she says they were instructed to fill their canteens during every class that they took and during the breaks between classes they had to drink the whole contents of the canteen and if there was anything left they would have to dump the water in the canteen over their head. Uh, so again she said the act of having to drink all that water made her physically sick but also the anxiety really was difficult for her to deal with and again Master Corporal Greg Young uh, denies having given any such order. Okay, so what are the people on the base saying about this? Very, very unusual case. Uh, certainly court martials themselves are very rare. Um, I did speak with Master Corporal Greg Young. Uh, he told me that whatever he may have done as an instructor, he felt it was in the best interests of his recruits. He also told me that when he underwent basic training, the kind of incidents that we've just described would have been considered tame. Whether that is true, it is certainly the case that society's expectations of workplace uh, standards and behaviors have changed quite a lot, and the Canadian military is trying to catch up. Certainly, it is taking uh, these incidents very seriously. Uh, court martial is a serious thing, and uh, hey, you know, they're not free. Yeah, and what happens next? Uh, well, this case will continue tomorrow uh, with Master Corporal Greg Young expected to take the stand. All right, well, we will be watching. Thank you very much, Zach. You're welcome. <laughs>
fall, which uh, of course, oh my. Uh, out at Cape, I was out at Cape Spear. I did yes, get uh, I clocked at 119 with my handheld anemometer, which is what he has there. But man, that is just so intense. What if something hit him? Yeah, like well, you want to make sure you pick a spot where you're probably not going hit, to get hit by debris. And hopefully he did pick a safe spot. Mm -hmm. That's why I went out to Cape, Cape Spear, Spear where there was not a lot of debris yeah. to potentially hit me. Uh, boy, that has me uh, <laughs> foaming at the mouth for winter <laughs> storm season. Uh, anyway, great stuff there. Uh, speaking of Irma, there it is, uh, which is, again, weakening. Now still a tropical storm rolling up into the southeast parts of the U.S. Uh, unrelated to that system that's uh, been moving in, uh, that's been raining itself out over our neck of the woods this weekend and the one that is moving in now. Uh, so Irma, not an issue. We will have to keep an eye on Jose as we mo move into next week. Not a threat this week, but it's going to sit and spin for the next three, four, five, six days. And where it goes beyond that is still very, very much up in the air. So that's certainly one we'll have to keep an eye on, uh, certainly in the coming days. Uh, closer to home, this is the system that has been, again, pulling rain up uh, from the south. Periods of rain moving back into metro as we speak. And that rain will spread across the island tonight. The most persistent rain tomorrow, as I mentioned earlier, from Bonavista Bay across to Cornerbrook through central. I think St. John's across the Avalon, the southeast, generally Cloudy with periods of drizzle on the go tomorrow. Wouldn't even rule out a sunny break uh, for Placentia Bay down across the Buren Peninsula to for tomorrow. Cartwright, Happy Valley Goose Bay up towards the north coast. That'll be the best spot across the province tomorrow. Mid to high teens. Labrador City increasing clouds and some showers rolling in for you folks. Future tracker moves beyond and watch again this low block to the south continues to throw at least some moisture up into the mix. I think we're still looking at some lingering drizzle across most of the island for Wednesday morning into the afternoon. I think it lingers for the Avalon, but we're gradually clearing from west into central Newfoundland through the day on Wednesday. Still some scattered shower possibilities across Labrador on Wednesday. You can see temperatures are going to struggle 13, 14, 15, maybe as warm as 16 along the south coast and uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay may see a break or two of sun, but generally Labrador is cloudy on Wednesday as well. Now for Thursday, that low will finally start to depart. Uh, a bit of a trough line moving through may throw a bit of cloud cover into the mix. The northern peninsula uh, areas of the west coast, but generally it's a sun cloud mix across the island and a pretty nice one indeed. Labrador again, chance of a shower over the west, but it's pretty quiet overall on Thursday. Temperatures are going to range from 18 to 22 on the island and 10 to 14 degrees in Labrador. Pretty quiet again for Friday into Saturday. We will watch a an approaching system through the weekend. Uh, forecast models have yet to nail that down. It's going to be a quick mover. May dart some showers into the mix uh, for uh, uh, for Sunday into Monday. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye on that one over the next couple of days. Temperatures generally riding into those mid-teens. And Labrador's forecast, again, some showers in the mix the next couple. Your Friday, Saturday, Sunday stretch looking pretty good as well. Well, let's meet our young athlete of the day. Here is a young soccer player from Manuals. Rachel Power is three years old and plays on the Chili Willy team with Mini Kick Soccer. This is Rachel's first year playing soccer and she loves it. Way to go, Rachel. You're today's young athlete of the day. As we mentioned earlier, this is the 16th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and it was marked at the White House with President Trump and the First Lady paying their respects with a moment of silence at 8.46 a.m. That's the time the first plane struck the World Trade Center. The rituals of mourning continued later at the Trade Center Memorial in New York.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Some good news tonight about the recovery from Hurricane Harvey. Most schools reopened today in the Houston, Texas area, but students affected by the storm are still facing some difficult challenges. Many of their families remain homeless as they return to class. Officials say they will welcome displaced students with a lot of flexibility. The Federal Parliament Standing Committee on Health began hearings today on Bill C-45, the Cannabis Act. Starting on an interesting mission, our study on Bill C-45, an act respecting cannabis, and uh, I expect it's going to be very interesting. The committee is hearing from a variety of witnesses before reporting back to the House of Commons. The Trudeau government wants the legislation in place by July 1st, 2018. The committee has until June to move the bill through all the stages, including the House and Senate. Well, the sweet summer days of building sandcastles on the beach are over for the year. Yes, but one team of artists made sure they go out with a bang. Oh my. <laughs> this is the world's tallest sandcastle. It's nearly 17 meters high and it was built in Germany with the help of a Canadian. An international team of 15 artists spent two weeks sculpting the castle. It'll be on display for another few weeks before it's bulldozed. Wow. No hurricanes there. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want a big wave to take that out after all that work. Great, yeah, definitely great pictures there. All right, time for our viewer picture of the day, and it comes to us from the south coast, Conegra Bay, uh, which is uh, just northwest of Harbor Breton. And a great oh. shot there in Merriam. Uh, Marion Crib Roberts says, can you see the elephant man in the rock? And you can definitely see the trunk there yeah. uh, with that, uh, that top rock. Uh, beauty in the eye okay. of the beholder, of course, but uh, I can see it, Marion, I can. Yes. <laughs> I, I need it. to linger over that a bit more, but I can't linger because it's time to say goodnight. It's see you back here tomorrow. It's on my Facebook page. <laughs> Have another look there. Good night. Good night.